Don, talk to me about psychophysics because I mean, this incorporates experimental psychology, um, evolutionary biology, and so much within the field. Tell me about some of its limitations, perhaps, and maybe some of the assumptions psychophysics makes that some of the work you've been doing, or you, Prakash, Singh, etc., that might be changing the way we think about this field. So psychophysics is typically thought of as a study of the relationship between a physical stimulus and a psychological or perceptual response to that stimulus. And so you can think about, for example, the intensity of light in terms of the number of photons and then how bright it appears to, to the person looking or the amount of some kind of acid in, in some water that you're drinking and how bitter it, it might taste and, and so forth. So psychophysics has typically been uh, trying to quantify that relationship to sort of get at the mind body problem, the mind body interaction in a mathematically precise fashion where we say, we know the amount of the physical stimulus and we can then try to measure the amount of the psychological response. And in that way, we can begin to get psychophysical laws. And so psychophysicists have found uh, various so-called power laws as the intensity of the stimulus grows in certain fashion, then you can figure out how much the, the perceptual response grows. And so, so it, was a, it was an attempt and, and, and is an attempt to um, understand with quantitative precision the consciousness physics relationship. So it's, it's, it's been a, a very useful and powerful framework because it, it forces you to be um, very, very precise, to make very, very careful experiments uh, you know, where you control the physical stimuli and then measure the subjective responses. So that, it's, it's, it's a wonderful field. I've spent a lot of time doing psychophysics myself. And so it's, it's, a, it's, it, it's a, a worthwhile endeavor. <clears throat> but tell me about the assumption he makes. I mean, doesn't he make the one assumption that there is an observer independent world out there? Well, yes, and this is a ubiquitous assumption among most of my colleagues, and that is that that space and time and physical objects with their properties is the fundamental nature of objective reality. And so space-time is fundamental, physical objects like tables and chairs and water and the sun and the moon and particles, elementary particles, this is all... Um, what we can count on is the objective reality. And then psychophysics has to start with that notion of objective reality and explain how conscious experiences somehow arise. And in psychophysics, the, the part that I mentioned before was one attempt at a, a precise measurement of the relationship between this presumed physical uh, world and the you know, conscious response that comes from it. So this, I would say 99% of my friends and colleagues uh, in, in cognitive science, neuroscience, artificial intelligence, um, who are, are studying consciousness and, and or doing psychophysics, which is a specific enterprise within this whole field, they, they all assume that, uh, you know, physical objects exist, even if they're not perceived, and in particular, their brains and neurons exist even if they're not perceived, and that somehow neural activity is responsible or embodied neural activity, not just activity and st stuck inside of you know, the cranium, but the, the, the neural activity in, in response to the motor actions of the body and the, the you know, input from the environment, that whole perception, decision, action loop um, that involves the, the nervous system centrally is somehow um, then responsible for the generation of consciousness. So I would say that, you know, 99% of, of my, my friends and colleagues uh, who are studying this problem um, have that, that point of view. We start with neural activity, a physical system, uh, embodied neural activity, and we have to boot up consciousness. And so, so there's a lot of assumptions there, uh, and we can go into that. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, because, I mean, that's obviously a great place to start, because we know that with the conscious, I mean, we have a lot to chat about conscious realism, conscious agents, interface theory of perception. And I think 
st- touching on the fact that the main assumption that we're all making is that there must be a veridical truth out there that we can see at some point. And evolution, obviously, I mean, from the work, when you, when you claim that, when you say that reality is not what we think it is, I know a lot of neuroscientists cringe and fringe and, uh, and tend to think that perhaps that's a bit of an, an out there type of theory, very metaphysical. But the truth is you're doing a lot of accurate physics here. And I mean, I've read a lot of your papers and some of the work is very convincing when you're talking about the probabilities uh, of verticality and it comes to fitness payoffs. Let's talk about some of that. Talk to me about what evolution mm-hmm. has done in order to make us see a reality that perhaps is not veridically true or does not have the capital T true that we all are searching for. Exactly. So evolution is, of course, an important framework that I and and my colleagues use um, in studying um, the mind and and consciousness. A a lot of wonderful work has been done in it. and, And none of my colleagues think that evolution has shaped us to see all of the truth, right? They'll they'll say that um, we've been shaped by evolution so that our senses report those aspects of objective reality that we we need in our niche to survive and reproduce. And so what we see might be very different from what a jewel beetle sees and what we perceive just because our niches are different. And so 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 and and there's also very, very good work in in standard evolutionary theory um, that suggests that there are cases in which we could be deceived. And Steven Pinker has some wonderful um, work on this in his, his book, How the Mind Works, and his paper, um, uh, So How Does the Mind Work? You know, a response to Jerry Fodor, in which he outlines five different reasons why evolution might lead us to have you know, false perceptions. You know, so for, for example, um, we're a competitive species. Um, we, you know, if, if, if we're also cooperative. If, if we're going to go out and hunt and gather and then share our resources at the end of the day, I might decide that uh, I'd like to loaf and not uh, put my life on the line hunting bison and so forth. So I might just go sit down by the river, take it easy, come back and say, I had a hard day. Could I have some of yours, Joe? I mean, you, you, you got a bison, got to have some of yours. And, you know, it turns out that if everybody's cooperating and I defect, I, I, I cheat, that's very, very fit. And that my, my fitness is enhanced. If, and but if everybody cheats, then the whole system falls down. So this is sort of what's called frequency dependent selection. So we have to evolve then the ability to detect the cheaters. Otherwise, you're going to be taken advantage of. And so you get this evolutionary arms race where the cheaters get better at cheating and deceiving, and the the cooperators get better at detecting. And and Trivers is very famous for pointing out that the ultimate in this is where you get to the point where you're such so good at deceiving the, the, the cheaters are so good at deceiving because they have gotten to the point where they deceive themselves. So they don't betray that they're lying because they don't even know that they're lying. So there's no blushing or shifting eyes or anything like that because you believe your own lie. And so, so there are in the standard evolutionary understanding of things, there are these special cases in which um, we have the idea that non-truth and self-deception can evolve. And, and, and so Pinker's paper is a great one on this. But we've taken this perhaps a step further. W- what we argue is that if you look at the structure of evolution, ev- evolutionary theory, in particular using the mathematics of evolutionary game theory that John Maynard Smith introduced in the 1970s by wedding game theory with evolutionary theory, we can ask a technical question. This is now a plain, a plain, mathematically precise question. What is the probability that evolution by natural selection would shape any sensory system of any organism to report any truths about objective reality, whatever that objective reality might be? And you might say, how, how in the world could evolutionary theory do that? I mean, look at how it's phrased. We're, we're talking about physical organisms looking for physical resources and fighting and killing each other with physical bodies in space and time. So, I mean, of course, we're assuming that our sensory systems tell us the truth, that there is a space and time, there are physical. So how in the world could we do that? Well, and, and it turns out the beauty of the mathematics of evolutionary game theory is it gets at the algorithmic core of evolutionary theory, 
without all the extra trappings, the trappings that were useful in, for example, Darwin creating the theory in the first place. So very, very, but when you get to the core of natural selection, that's an algorithm. And so we can talk about these abstract strategies, competing and so forth, and we can look at the mathematics. Um, so, so it's a clean technical question, I'll restate it. What is the probability that natural selection will shape any sensory system of any organism to tell any truths about objective reality? And the answer is with one exception that we can go into, the probability is zero, uh, precisely zero in, in the limit. The, and that, that's a, a, a stunning result, right? I that, very stunning as well. That was something that really captured my attention. That, that, that's right. And it was surprising to me, too. I mean, when I went into this, I, I decided to, to look at this like in the 2005-2008 period. I, you know, I knew evolutionary theory and evolutionary psychology, uh, but I this question sort of intrigued me. Everybody, all of my colleagues are just assuming that we can talk with uh, you know, coherence about a physical universe, space and time and objects that exist. And, and we can be very confident that that's our starting point. And I thought, well, evolutionary theory can actually weigh in mm. on that. We, we, we can take our theories seriously and ask what are their mathematical implications. And, and so it was, it was a bit of a surprise to me to find out that the probability was, was zero and, and for the reasons why. W one big reason is that Evolutionary theory requires, at, at the core, this notion of a fitness payoff function. So uh, if I, you know, just to get at the idea of a fitness payoff, um, if I'm a hungry lion and I'm looking to eat, um, a T-bone steak would have a lot of fitness payoffs. That could really enhance my, my, my fitness. And, and by the way, fitness in evolutionary terms, I mean, we, we think about it, it mathematically like you're playing a game and you're, you're getting points and trying to, to beat the competition in the game but those points really convert into the reproductive success what is you know how how many offspring do you have and so forth so so we go back and forth between those two ver thinking uh, versions of thinking about this but you can think about it as like a game you, you're in a game you have to get as many points as possible to get to the next level you have to get more points than the competition and so forth so so the notion of fitness then is like the notion of the, the, the points you get in the game, right? So for the hungry lion looking to eat, that steak offers it a lot of fitness points. But if the, the lion is sated and looking to mate, well, that same steak offers it basically zero fitness payoffs. And, and if you're a cow, well, that, that T-bone steak offers you no fitness for any action that you might take. So, so in general, you can see that fitness payoffs vary from organism to organism and also from the the state of the organism, hungry versus sated, and also the action, feeding, fighting, fleeing, and mating, the, you know, the, the famous four Fs. So, so mathematically, a fitness payoff function is a function from objective reality, whatever that might be. The nice thing is it doesn't, you don't need to assume that you know what that objective reality is. Whatever the reality of, of the universe is, and whatever structures, mathematical structures it might have, we can just say that's you know let it be call it w with its structures you know a, a, a measure uh, it, it could be a, a topology a total order a partial order a metric whatever it might be we, we can ask the question in full generality whatever structures the world might have so we that we'll call that w then it depends on the the world its state and the organism and its state the action and so forth and the competition. So we can then look at these payoff functions and they'll take values say from zero to 100, where zero means you're dead, 100 means that's the best you could do. You know, zero means you don't reproduce at all, 100 means you have the best chance, that kind of thing. So, so it's, a, it's a function and we can then look at those functions, mathematical functions, we can ask a technical question. One, one question is, um, for any structure that you might consider the world to have, say a total order, so by total order, I mean, for example, one is less than two, is less than three, is less than four. Each number is, it, that's a total order. Um, so we could think about, you know, quantities that have a total order. What is the probability that a randomly chosen payoff function 
will preserve information about that total order, right? So the world has some total order, like say the amount of some resource, you know, thinking abstractly, you know, the amount of water or the amount of oxygen in the air, the percentage of oxygen in the air. What evolutionary theory doesn't give us any reason to pick one fitness payoff function over another. All are equally likely, right? The, the, and someone who wants to argue on that point would have to, I would be happy to have them argue on that point. That would be a very interesting argument. You would have to add to modern evolutionary theory. You would have to add something to the theory that's not there right now. And that would be, I would, I would welcome someone who wanted to, to add something that said, here are why only these kinds of fitness payoff functions should be considered and not these others. There's only one, I'll get to one restriction and only one that I think is, is legitimate. But, but in general, I'll just say every fitness payoff function that's conceivable, that's possible, um, is equally likely from an evolutionary framework. So we can then ask a technical question. For the case where the world has a total order, how many fitness payoff functions now, out of all of them that are that are potentially available, what fraction of those payoff functions would actually preserve information about that total order? Right? And, and why is that interesting question here? If your payoff function does not contain information about that total order, and your senses are being tuned to the payoff function, they cannot be tuned to the total order because the, the payoff function has no information about that total order. So, so it's critical that the payoff function be what we call a homomorphism yes. of the structure in the objective reality. If it's not a homomorphism, then, then the information simply isn't there to be tuned to. So you can go in case after case and write it down. This is, this is well, put it this way. Um, I'm working with a mathematician, so it's hard enough that um, I, I can't do it by myself, but I have some good math, mathematician friends, Chetan Prakash and Manish Singh and others that I've worked with who, who are far better than me at mathematics. I can phrase the problems, but they can solve the problems. <laughs> and what we find in case after case is the probability um, as the number of states in the world increases, the number of payoff values increases, the probability uh, that any payoff function preserves any structure, basically, that you want to think of goes to zero. The, the probability goes precisely to zero. So the probability is precisely zero that payoff functions even contain the information that would be needed to shape systems to see aspects of, of the truth. The one exception, this is a technical aside, if people don't understand this, it's not that important. There is one structure called a sigma algebra or sigma additive class. These are so-called measurable structures um, that you need to talk about probabilities. And any scientific theory requires that whatever reality is, probabilities of events in reality are not arbitrarily related to probabilities of events in our perceptions, in our, in our measurements. If, if they were arbitrarily related, then we couldn't do science. So it's not just evolutionary theory, but science in general requires that there's some homomorphism. It doesn't mean that it's, it's an isomorphism. It could be a, an infinite to one mapping. So the world could be infinitely more complex in its probabilistic structure than anything that we perceive. But we do have to have some correspondence between probabilities and perceptions and probabilities and reality. Other than that, there are no constraints in our theorem holds. So any structure that you might think of, again, topologies, metrics, partial orders, total orders, anything that you might think, the answer is going to be the probability is zero. And so that's a, a stunning result. It's, it's in, in the big picture, what, what we're doing is we're saying, let's take our best scientific theories seriously. I'm not claiming that evolution by natural selection is the final word. I don't think any scientific theory that we have today is the final word. So I'm not dogmatic about our scientific theories. On the other hand, we have no better tools. And so we have to take our current tools, our current scientific theories um, at face value and, and take them very, very seriously. And our current theory 
evolution by natural selection says very, very clearly the probability is zero that any sensory system is shaped to see any aspect of objective reality, mm -hmm. except for the measurable, the sigma algebras. That's, that's a stunning result. Now we might say, well, in that case, I don't believe the theory. I, I believe that I see objective reality, so I need to change the theory. Very, very good, fine, go ahead. And you need to then change evolutionary game theory and revise it such that um, there is a principled way in which those payoff functions preserve those structures. And I think someone should try it. That's perfect. On the other hand, there's another one of our fundamental theories, which is quantum field theory together with, with gravity, um, which is saying a similar thing. And then that's, it's a bit of a surprise. You, you, I'm sure that many people hearing what I just said would say, well, look, it's one thing for a cognitive scientist or evolutionary psychologist to say, you know, that, that we don't see the truth of, of space and time and physical objects. I mean, but, uh, you know, you're just a cognitive scientist. The, the physicists, that's their turf, and we should let them weigh in. They're the ones who, who own that territory about space and time and physical objects. Surely they will put you in your place. Well, what's remarkable is that physics for several centuries has been about what happens in space and time. And more recently, what happens in space-time, the, the union of space and time. But in the last couple decades, the best physics theories, quantum field theory together with gravity, have forced physicists to the following statement. And this is now a quote, space-time is doomed, period. Space-time is doomed. And that means all the things inside space-time particles, physical objects. When they say space-time is doomed, what they're saying is we've had this framework in physics in which space-time is the fundamental reality. It's the framework in which everything happens. That can't be. And it's physics itself. This is not some religious waking up or something like that that they're having. Their own theories are precise enough to tell you where they stop. They're precise enough to predict their own demise. And so I can sketch out real briefly what the, the arguments that they give, but the argument is that space-time cannot be the fundamental nature of reality. They need to find some deeper mathematical structures and show how space-time arises from it. And there's, there's two, I'll give you two brief reasons that they give. And I should mention, for those who want to check up on this cognitive scientist and see if I'm blowing smoke here, um, Nima Arkani Hamed. So Nima, N-I-M-A, Arkani Hamed, A-R-K-A-N-I dash H-A-M-E-D at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton. He's got a course at Harvard, 2019. If you look at his course at Harvard, you can see precisely in 25, 30 lectures why space-time is doomed, um, why they have to let go of space-time and the fantastic new structures. They're, they're not just throwing up their hands and pulling their hair and saying, oh, oy vey, we can't do this. No, they're saying, this is fantastic news. Space-time had a great run for several centuries. It's over. Space-time is dead. It's not fundamental. But there are new structures like the cosmological polytope, the amplitudehedron, associahedron. There are these wonderful structures that don't require space-time. They don't require Hilbert spaces. They, they don't require quantum theory. They don't require time. These are structures beyond space and time, beyond Hilbert spaces. So this is not saying quantum theory is more fundamental than space. It's saying that quantum theory and space time both emerge together from a deeper theory in which space and time don't even figure. Space and time is just a data structure. And that's what evolutionary theory is saying. Evolutionary theory is saying that space and time is merely a data structure that organisms, that particular organisms, humans, have evolved for fitness purposes to stay alive long enough to reproduce. So the argument that the physicists give is, is, is stunning. One has to do, basically the spoiler is gravity. The party gets spoiled by gravity. And the problem is this, when you try, in, in physics, we try to go to smaller and smaller scales, part, partly because of the reductionist framework that's been so useful 
in, in science, the methodology of, of reductionism, that as you go to smaller scales in space or space time, you find more fundamental laws, right? So the heat of the air around me is, if I understand temperature, well, I need to go down to a smaller level where I see molecules. And I, I discovered that temperature of, of, of the air is really the, uh, the, the mean molecular kinetic energy of the molecules in the air. So it's been a very successful. So the ontology of space time and the methodology of reductionism has been remarkably successful. And what physics has shown us is that the way to go to smaller and smaller levels of space-time, scales of space-time, is like to look at it with light that has a shorter and shorter wavelength, right? Because to resolve things, you need to have smaller wavelengths to resolve them. And what quantum theory tells us is that as you go to smaller wavelengths, the energy is getting higher and higher. E equals H nu is the formula. Energy equals Planck's constant times the frequency. So in a world without gravity, that's no problem. We can just go in, in principle to higher and higher energies and go to smaller. And so reductionism is fine, it's perfectly good. And so everything is hunky-dory. Gravity is the spoiler because as we go to higher and higher energies, energy equals mass, Einstein's theory of special relativity. And as you get more and more energy, you get more and more mass into a smaller and smaller region of space. And at some point you create a black hole and you destroy the very thing that you're trying to observe. And, and, and this happens fairly quickly. It's at only 10 to the minus 33 centimeters that space time ceases to be it's not that there's pixels there. It's that it ceases to be a, a coherent concept. It, it doesn't. Now, I, I would have been impressed with space time if it, was, if it was 10 to the minus 33 trillion centimeters. I would go, oh, wow. But 10 to the minus 33, th th this is a data structure that doesn't go very deep. And it, it falls apart pretty quickly. And, and, and so that's one argument. A, a second argument is from quantum theory, again, with, with gravity. The quantum theory... Quantum theory with gravity says there are no local observables in space time. If, if you take any finite sized room and ask, is there anything in that you can measure with with high precision, as much precision as you want in that room? And the answer is no. And here's the here's the reason. In, in quantum theory, you have to make this division between the system that's being observed and the app, the measuring apparatus. And the measuring apparatus in quantum theory is also another system with uncertainties. It, it satisfies the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And so, so that means that if you want to get more and more precision in your measurements, say of the you know, position of the electron or its momentum or its spin, the, the axis of spin, um, you're gonna have to have more degrees of freedom in your measuring apparatus because it also has uncertainty. Well, so as you add, so I've, I've got this fixed size room and I have this measuring apparatus and this electron that I'm measuring, and I want more and more precision. So I add more and more degrees of freedom to my measuring apparatus. At some point, you get so many degrees of freedom that the whole room collapses into a black hole. <clears throat> so once again, and this is the, actually deeper than the first one. This is the deeper reason. It, it's, it's the theory of measurement in quantum theory together with gravity. So, so what we have to summarize is this stunning convergence of predictions between our two foundational theories of science, evolution of a natural selection and the physics of quantum field theory together with gravity. Both are telling us unequivocally that space-time is doomed. Objects in space-time are doomed. And so I'll be very, very clear. Space-time is not a pre-existing object. Time itself is a useful fiction. And the physicists are finding structures beyond space-time. And I'll just, I'll just point to them, but people can find more about it themselves. <clears throat> um, again, I suggest lectures by Nima or Connie Hamed. He's got some public lectures for broad audiences. So there are lectures where it's not just for physicists, it's for the average cognitive scientist who would like to understand what he's talking about. <clears throat> but what they're finding are structures that predict the scattering amplitudes for the processes at the, say the Large Hadron Collider where two gluons smash into each other, four gluons go 
flying out, um, they, they need to get the probabilities, what they call the probability amplitudes for these kinds of processes to really analyze the data that they're getting out of them. And what they found is when you let go of space time and you go to these deeper structures, you discover symmetries, something called the dual conformal symmetry and other symmetries that are true of the scattering data, but cannot be seen in space time. And you find that the mathematics, if you do a, the computation of these probabilities in space time using Feynman's approach, you know, Feynman integrals and so forth, you, you end up with hundreds of pages of algebra to like just two, you know, two gluons in, five gluons out. It's, it's a mess. And when you're doing millions or billions of these you know, per second, you, you, just, you can't be computing that. So th this really put the uh, pressure on them to try understand how to do this faster. When you let go of space time, Nima and many others working on this have found simple formulas that are two or three or four terms that you can compute by hand that, that get rid of the hundreds of pages of algebra. So, so what the physicists are finding is, is the following. The ontology of space-time and the methodology of reductionism have been spectacularly successful tools of physics and science for several centuries. But though, and those tools are so precise that they're now telling us the end of their reign. They're telling us it's over, that we have to find new, deeper tools. So space-time is doomed, reductionism is dead. It is simply not true that as you go to smaller and smaller scales in space-time, you will find the more and more fundamental laws. In fact, as you try to go to smaller and smaller scales with you know, finer and finer light, you know, frequencies of light, what eventually happens is the, you create black holes, and then as you put more energy, go, try to go to smaller scales, you actually go to larger and larger scales. The black holes get bigger and bigger. Reductionism is dead. So, so our two premier theories are both telling us that space-time is dead um, and physics, you know, I've, evolution by natural selection, I don't think, I have to think about it. I haven't seen that it says that reductionism is dead, but physics does. Physics tells us that reductionism is dead and both tell us that space-time is dead. I guess if space-time is dead, um, reductionism is dead because reductionism is going to smaller scales in space-time. So yeah, both of our theories are telling us that reductionism is dead too. Now, there, just like, you know, we, we could say you know, Newtonian theory is dead. There are certain problems, though, that we still will attack, tackle with Newtonian theory. And, and of course, there'll be certain problems we'll still tackle with quantum field theory and so forth. So in that sense, yeah, it, there's a provisional life for reductionism and space time. But we now know that that's just like Newtonian theory. It, it, it's only for certain special problems. And it's not, a, it's not a deep theory. If you're interested in the nature of reality, you don't go with Newton. You, you've got to go beyond it. And so when we're studying consciousness and so forth, that's where this comes, becomes important. 99% of my colleagues are studying consciousness in apparent, either not aware that space-time is doomed and that reductionism is dead, or, or choosing to ignore it. I, 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 I think in many cases, they, they're just, just not aware that space-time is, is doomed. And, that, and so we start with things like neurons, and we assume that they exist and have you know, definite values of their physical properties, like position and momentum and spin, even when they're not observed, or, or that networks have certain properties. And that, that, that's simply false. You, to, to have a theory of consciousness that starts with neural activity is to simply ignore what our best science is telling us. In, in fact, evolution and quantum field theory are telling us space-time itself does not exist as a fundamental entity, and nor do any objects. And so this is the, so when I look at the theories that say, well, you know, we're going to have um, microtubules and their quantum states, or we're going to have... Um, um, working memory and, and broadcasting systems for you know, the global workspace broadcasting, or we're going to have physical systems and their integrated information. So I'll have a physical system and its integrated information. Every one of these theories um, is is missing what modern science is, is saying to us, which is space time is doomed. You need a new new foundation. Now, if these if they're if they were trying to start now with say something like the cosmological polytope and amplitude hedron. And saying now we'll start with that and boot up consciousness. Uh, 
you'd have my attention. But, but it, you know, it's over for space time, especially for something, you know, where we're trying to deeply understand. We're not just trying to solve some little technical, how do I build a bridge and not have it fall down and so forth. We're, we're trying to understand deeply what consciousness is. It seems silly to start with something that we know isn't the fundamental nature of reality and try to boot. So panpsychism as well. So, uh, and, and again, people who are doing this, I'm friends with most of them. I mean, they're, they're, they're buddies and friends and, and so forth. So there's nothing personal here, but, but you know, panpsychism, it also basically starts with physicalism. There are particles like electrons and protons that they really do exist, but we need in addition to their position and momentum and spin charge and kinds of things like that, we need to add a unit of consciousness. So, so, so it's, it's, but it's assuming that these particles in, sp in space time really exist. And, and so panpsychism is out as well. So it, it's, it's quite remarkable, this, the state of play in, in my field that, that our best theories are telling us it's over for space time and therefore it's over for neurobiological reductionism because it's over for reductionism, period. Not, not just neuro neurobiological reductionism. And, and, and so I think it's going to be very interesting in history of science to look back at this period B because I mean, my colleagues are brilliant. They know evolutionary theory, but, but here, here, here I think is, is the issue. It's almost incomprehensible to us that we don't see reality as it is. It, it's just inconceivable. It, 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 well, the, the first time that I seriously took that idea and, and thought about it and, and said, this might actually be the case. It, it was so shocking to me, I had to sit down. So I completely understand why, my, the, but that's the glory of science. The glory of science is that our theories are so precise that they can come back, slap us in the face and say, wake up, you, you, you wrote down this theory, here's what it entails. D just like Einstein's theory of, of gravity, mm -hmm. general relativity, we wrote down in, 1915, published in 1915, a, a year or two later, Schwarzschild, a, a German on the front lines of World War I, was playing with the math and discovered it, in, it entailed what we call black holes. Einstein didn't know that. He didn't like it. He didn't believe it. And he, he for decades, was against black holes. And that's why we have scientific theories, because the theories come back and they become our teachers and we become the students. And so what we've learned, and, and most of my colleagues in cognitive neuroscience studying consciousness are you know, very aware of, of evolutionary theory and, and even evolutionary game theory. That theory is coming back to us and saying, hey, look, it's over for reductionism. It's over for neurobiological reductionism. You need a deeper framework. Um, it, and so it's gonna be very interesting in history of science to see how long it takes us this generation to get past our preconceptions, uh, our assumption, but it's going to be very much like what, if we look back, like in the 1880s and 1890s at physics, Newton had been so successful for centuries. It, some physicists were recommending that the bright students not go into physics because it was over. It was, it was, there were a couple little blips problems like the Michelson Morley experiment in 1887. Speed of light wasn't seeming to do the things it was supposed to do. And, and then there was, you know, black body radiation and, and Newton seemed to be getting, getting it wrong. It seemed to be predicting things a little bit wrong, well, a lot wrong, black body radiation. And, but, but, you know, not to worry, you know, Newton is fine. And within 20 years, it was all over, you know, by, by, by say 1926. So say 30 or 40 years, it was all over. It, it, we now understood that Newton is powerful as it is and, and still powerful for certain cases. I mean, we can send spacecraft to, to the moon using Newton. So it's, it's very, very powerful. But as a fundamental tool for understanding the nature of objective reality, no, no. It's a useful tool pragmatically, but the very concepts of space and time and even mass are the wrong concepts. Einstein's theories of relativity change the very concepts of space and time and even the notion of mass. And, and the notion of simultaneity. So as a framework for understanding reality, no. And the same thing is now true of space-time itself and quantum theory. As, as useful tools, they will continue. As deep 
conceptual tools for us to understand the nature of reality and consciousness? Absolutely not. We need to go to a, a deeper framework. And so it's going to be very interesting to see. Um, my attitude is that, I mean, my colleagues are so brilliant. The, the, the people working on this, you know, they're so brilliant. It, it, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking that this, this assumption is holding back mm. the flood of creative, intelligent theory, theory building that, that could happen here. So we need as quickly as possible to, to understand that it's over for space time and unleash the brilliance of my colleagues to find a deeper framework for understanding um, consciousness and relationship to what we call the physical world. And, you know, I completely agree with you because I mean, my, myself studying, when you study medicine, you study biology, you study all these things, um, you, you get caught up in the framework for a long period of time. You yeah. think that going to the neuron is going to help you get a correlate of consciousness. Something's going to happen. You're going to learn something new. And yes. I remember reading a book, it was a while back, but then I read a lot of your papers as well. And I like the fact that you use a lot of those examples where you talk about Copernicus, you talk about uh, all those fundamental shifts in the way we saw the world. I mean, nothing's revolved yeah. around, we're not at the center of the universe. Um, these small things that it was perceptually incorrect and worked with our current theories just suddenly stop and break down. And that's what science is about. I mean, if some, and you're very humble in the, in the fact that you say, if anyone can come to you with mathematics, disprove it, or to falsify any part of the theory, you'll accept it 100%. And that's what science is, which is which is brilliant. Um, but the one thing that surprised me was when I read all of these papers, I asked two of my like, close, almost best friends who are physicists, uh, astrophysicists, and both of them don't believe space-time is fundamental anymore. So it kind of messed me up a little bit because <laughs> <laughs> I start questioning my own perception of consciousness and how I perceive it. And at this point, I don't know what where, where to go with it. But you have what is known as interface theory of perception. I think let's perhaps go into that at the moment. I mean, you're using things like um, genetic algorithms, uh, evolutionary games, all these different ways to show how perceptual strategies change. There's, you've got naive realism, you've got um, critical realism, all these different variations. And yet this interface theory seems to be giving us the best outcome. Uh, so let's, let's get into that's right. So the uh, natural question arises. If you're saying that our sensory systems don't show us the truth, number one, what good are they? If they're not showing you the truth, you know, how in the world could they possibly be good for you? And what would you claim that they are showing instead? Right. So and, and most people, when they say that they they have the feeling of gotcha and it's all over. And I get that all the time. Emails going, if you, you know, if, if you don't see the truth, we'll step in front of that train and you'll, you know, the truth will hit you in the face. Right. So gotcha. It's all over. Well, and, and so the, the answer is, is from evolutionary theory itself, right? Our senses evolved to allow us to survive long enough to reproduce full stop. That's evolutionary theory. What they so a good metaphor for understanding what evolution has really done. If it's not shown us the truth, what has it done? A good metaphor is it's given you like a user interface, like the desktop interface on on your laptop or your mobile device. So if you're writing an email, and the icon on your desktop for the email is blue and rectangular, and in the lower right corner of your screen, it doesn't mean that the email itself is blue and rectangular. In the lower right corner of your computer, anybody who thought that fundamentally misunderstands the point of the interface. It's not there to show you the truth, which in this metaphor is the diodes and resistors and voltages and magnetic fields and some, you know, fabulously difficult computer inside, you know, it, it's in fact, it's not there to show you that it's there to hide it. We, we pay good money for the interface specifically because we don't want to know the truth. If you know the truth, it'll get in the way. If you had to toggle voltages to send an email, your friends wouldn't hear from you. So, so the, that's and so that's what evolution did. Reality, whatever it is, is this complicated thing, presumably. You need to stay alive long enough to reproduce. So evolution gives you a useful interface that lets you interact with reality and manipulate reality 
without having to know all the bells and whistles of what you're doing to reality. So, so that's what evolution did. So interface, so our sensory systems are not windows on the truth, they're user interfaces. They're like a virtual reality. If you're playing a virtual reality game, like say multiplayer uh, Grand Theft Auto with people around the world, and you see, a, 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 I see a green Camaro uh, from someone in China that I'm playing with, right? And I look, I turn over there, I turn my headset and I see that green Camaro, then I look over there and it disappears. I create the green Camaro when I look, and I then garbage collect it. I throw it away when I look over there. There is no real green Camaro. There, you know, in this metaphor, there's some again, some supercomputer with voltages and magnetic fields and diodes and so forth. And but all of us can talk about the green Camaro because we all share a similar user interface. And so we can talk about the green Camaro, even though I create my Camaro when I look, and you know, Bob creates his Camaro and Sally creates her Camaro when they look. And so, so, and that's what I've, the reason why we have this feeling that we're all seeing the same object. I look up and I see the moon and you look up and say, oh yeah, I see the moon. And yeah, it's just above that tree over there. And, and we both agree is the same reason why when I'm playing a virtual reality game with you, that we can both agree that there's a green Camaro over there. It's not because the green Camaro exists when it's not perceived and it's not the fundamental reality. It's just that we share our user interface. And so we have this a coordination of our user interfaces from an evolutionary point of view that gives us the useful fiction of a shared physical reality. And that's just a useful fiction. And, and I think that, you know, we're about to have a generation that is raised on the metaverse. Mm. And I think the stuff that I'm saying right now, you know, 30 years from now, they'll look back and they'll, they'll go, why did you have to say that? And this is just obvious, right? If you spend several hours a day in the metaverse and you take your headset off, it's going to be a no brainer to say, well, I probably still have a headset on that my evolutionary given headset. And so I think that what I'm saying will just be obvious. But but uh, I would like it to be obvious to my current generation because I want I mean there's so many bright people in my field. Once we get rid of these these nonsense assumptions that we've made, they can start to make real progress. You know they're really bright. So I want to see I want to see where we can go with this. But 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 anyway. So so the interface theory of perception. So so sorry. if you think about it, when you, I mean your analogy of this user interface, even Daniel Dennett uses it, but to show the illusion of consciousness within right. physical reality. I mean, he still uses this desktop analogy where the computers, you're just clicking on icons, throwing things into the recycle bin, but it's not really happening that way. But he uses the same analogy in a very different way. So it's interesting to see how different these two theories can be. Yet so right. They, exactly. Consciousness is a user illusion. And and Keith Frankish has a similar, and, and you know, Keith is a, a, a brilliant, wonderful man. Uh, you know, I had a wonderful conversation with him a couple years ago at, at the, the, the the Tucson conference online and so forth. Um, so, so these are brilliant. And, and Dan Dennett, I mean, he's, he's, he's a brilliant thinker. I, I, I just think that it, it, it was quite respectable a, f a few decades ago to have a reductionist physicalist framework. I mean, our, we, we didn't have this theory, this theorem from evolution of a natural section. We, and we didn't have the physicists telling it this, that space time is doomed. So it was perfectly respectable starting framework you know, four decades ago, and even you know, Francis Crick did it, and he says you're nothing but a pack of neurons, right? So it was, it, was, it was perfectly respectable, but science moves on. That's the glory of science, and, and it's over for space-time, and the, the sooner my colleagues um, recognize that, their brilliance can then start to shine in this new, in this new direction. So, so anyway, that's space and time and physical objects are just a, a simple user interface or a virtual reality um, headset that 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 is useful for us from an evolutionary point of view, and that, that that's all it is. I mean, yeah, and so I mean, if you talk about the computational evolutionary perception, um, you use also the PDAs, these uh, perception, decision, action loops. Um, I mean, your theory is very intriguing. The way you've you've created this formula, and you're able to use this to tell us so much information about what's going on. Um, what is it telling us? Um, I mean, it's telling us that we're some sort of a a, a network um, you you call it some very similar to the twitterverse um right. tell me a little bit more about that well first i'll start off by saying that i'm probably wrong right so that's the, the i think the proper attitude in science is but here the move i've made is is, is the following space time is doomed holy smoke <laughs> I, i'm trying to understand consciousness in its relationship to the brain and that, that whole rug has been pulled out. I can't start with the brain. 
So what am I going to start with? What do I? So it's sort of poverty of my imagination. There's only one thing I can think of right now because I, you know, the cosmological polytope has not been and in, wasn't invented and so forth. So I'm saying, let me start with consciousness. Okay, so this is different. Instead of saying, start with brain activity and somehow boot up consciousness as a feature of certain kinds of like self-reflexive networks of brain activity and that kind of, so I get some self-reflective loop and self-reference and that kind of thing. I have to start with consciousness qua consciousness on its own terms. So I have to ask what, if I was going to just start with consciousness as fundamental, a fundamental science, what would I put down? And what, what is, and, and as a scientist, I want the minimal thing that I could put down. There's hundreds of things we could say about conscience. Free will, does it exist? Self-awareness, the, the thousands of kinds of qualia that we can, we can have. I mean, there's tons of things that we could, we, we could what, what is the essential core that we would try to build up a, a theory of consciousness? And so I picked three things. Out of, out of all of them. And someone might choose to say, uh, you picked the wrong three, and so let me start with something else. And, and I welcome that. I mean, again, I, I would bet against myself, so I'm just trying to be precise so that we can figure out where, as quickly as possible where I'm wrong. I picked to define a, what I call a conscious agent. So there's a mathematical structure that can have experiences, it has a range of experiences. Um, based on those experiences, it can influence the experiences of other conscious agents. That's it. Yes. So experiences lead to probabilistic influence of other experiences of other agents. That's so there's no notion of self yes. assumed, right? I don't. So if I'm going to have a notion of self, I'm going to have to build it yes. out of this mathematical framework. So what I want to do is to help myself to as little as possible. Make it as hard as possible. So mathematically, what it is, is it's, a, it's like Bayes-Net, but it's, it's Markovian kernels, which they get experiences in, and then they, the Markovian kernel describes how it affects the experiences going into other agents. And so you get a, a, a Markovian dynamics. So that's what, that's what it ends up being, is a, is a Markovian dynamics. And... It turns out when you have two conscious agents interacting, they satisfy the definition of a conscious agent. So, and by the way, if people want to, more details, I have a paper called Objects of Consciousness. So it's, it's online. If you just Google my name and Objects of Consciousness, it's online for free. So you can read the mathematical model. I'll put a link to it as well. For the, for the oh, thank you. Thank you very much. So people can go into, I mean, because I'm talking fast, Markovian kernels, a lot of people don't know what those are and so forth. But, 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 but I'll, I'll just say that it's a Markovian dynamical system. And one thing that I'm working on right now, thinking about is, is how to build up space time from it, right? So, so I have to, to be taken seriously, I have to not only explain features of consciousness, how do you build a self, for example, but also how do you build up space time and, and, and quantum physics and so forth from this. And so, so that's going to be, no, notice the, what we're doing in science, you always make assumptions and then say, if you grant me, you know, please grant me these assumptions. If you grant me these assumptions, then I will explain all this other fun stuff for you. So if you grant me space and time and physical objects, for example, then I can explain how neurons evolved and then I can explain how consciousness evolved. But if, if, we, if you don't grant me that, then you, you can't do it. But the, the thing, one thing is that science theories always make assumptions. And those assumptions are always what I would call miracles of the theory. They're the things that aren't explained, that can't be explained within the theory. You could always say, okay, well, I'll get a deeper theory that explains those assumptions, but you'll have your new assumptions. And so science always has, it can never get a theory of everything. It can only get a theory of everything except my assumptions. But the unpacking of, of those assumptions is never ending because you always have deeper and deeper assumptions. So this is a really interesting fact about yeah. the scientific enterprise. But, but anyway, so I'm now saying I have to, my task now that I've set myself is saying, please grant me that there are fundamental things that I'll call conscious entities, conscious agents that have experiences 
and that can probabilistically influence other agents with their experiences. That's my, my miracle. Then what I have to explain is how does space time emerge? How does the self emerge? How, does, how do I get um, dynamical systems of conscious agents leading to space time and quantum field theory and general relativity and so forth? If I can't, if, if there's some principled obstacle to me showing how space time and quantum field theory can arise or, or generalizations of those can arise from my theory of conscious agents, then I'm wrong. It's just flat out. So, so I do take, so here's a, a key point. I'm not saying that because space time is doomed, that we should just ignore everything that we've done in science and space time. Absolutely not. It's brilliant work. And all of that work, including all the work on neuroscience, is a boundary condition on a deeper theory. Any deeper theory that I propose beyond space time has to project into space time where we can make measurements. And it better give me back all the science that we know and love or generalizations of it. Otherwise, I'm wrong. So this is not hand wavy, I let go of space time, anything goes. No, 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 no. Everything that we've done in space time is extremely valuable. And all the neuroscience that we've done is extremely valuable. It's going to be a, a boundary condition, a constraint on any deeper theory. If it doesn't project and give me neuroscience, it's wrong. Just just, just flat out wrong. So so this is this is not just, you know, do whatever you want kind of thing. So I'll just sketch it really top level, the kind of thing that I'm thinking about. Um, and hopefully someone who's a lot smarter will take the idea and 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 beat our team to the punch. So I would rather just read about it next week instead of having to work on it for five years. Uh, so so the idea is that the long term behavior of these conscious agents, the, the so called asymptotic behavior has very interesting structures. And I'm those structures, I, I think we can show can map onto the structures that the physicists are finding beyond space time, the amplitudehedron, the cosmological polytope. So so it's a projection map. The dynamics of conscious agents is being taken to be fundamental in this framework. One projection is only looking at the long term behavior, the asymptotic behavior. So that's a projection of the theory. It, it's a simplification. That simplification gets mapped into the cosmological polytope and the amplitudehedron, which then the physicists show how to map into space time and they're showing how to then. So if I can, all I have to do is to show how the asymptotic dynamics of these conscious agents maps into cosmological polytopes and amplitudehedron, then I'm done. Then I get to inherit all of their work. So that's what I'm, what I'm working on. And so if someone can beat me to that, I would, I would much rather read the paper then 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 work this stuff out. <laughs> I just I, I'm just eager to know. I'm 66 years old, so you know I would rather know sooner rather than later. Um, <laughs> so, so that's what I'm working on. Yeah. I'm, so Don, it, I mean, it ends up becoming what is known as conscious realism. This is. You, yes. this, I just I'm curious to know before this whole realization that space time might not exist. What was your view prior to that? What what did you think consciousness was fundamentally? Did you think consciousness was a fundamental part of the universe? Was that always part of your thinking or had it changed after you realized this? It, it, I, I was on the fence. I, I, I just felt like I, I didn't know. The, my PhD was called computational psychology at, at MIT. So I was working with David Marr and, and Whitman Richards and, and I was in the artificial intelligence lab as well as in what's now the brain and cognitive science department. And my, I was trying to figure out how much we could actually boot up from an AI computational point of view. And I, at MIT, you get to, you can name your PhD. So I, I named it computational psychology because that was my mindset. Somehow computation is really essential to psychology. And, and now I think that I can't boot up <laughs> consciousness. From from computation, and and in that respect, I'm I'm very different from, for example, uh, Joe Shabak, who who I just had a wonderful conversation with, who, and and others who think that that the universe is fundamentally a computational system. Yes. And and I think that uh, Gödel's incompleteness theorem basically tells us that, you know, any computational system that's rich enough to model mathematics, you know, model arithmetic, I mean, model arithmetic, uh, there will always be true statements that can't be proven within that formal system. And if you add the, the, that true statement to your axioms, you'll, they'll always be new. So, so that in some sense, no finite theory, no finite computational theory 
is ever going to capture all of the truth. The notion of proof is weaker than the notion of truth. Mm. So, and, and that's that's a fundamental so I, I a fundamental restriction on how we should think about things. We can't we, we thought we'd hoped, Hilbert hoped that and we all hoped that we could get a theory of everything mm. and we write down these fundamental axioms and the derivation rules and all truths just we crank them out. And 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 no what's interesting is reason is deep enough to tell us where reason stops. Mm. It, that's, that's, it's incredible that we can use reason to say, here's where reason stops and, and, and truth extends beyond. So, so my attitude at, you know, to your question, I, I've been on the fence and when I really, I was working on a theory of perception with Bruce Bennett and Chaitan Prakash in 1986. I was trying to take what I'd done in perception at MIT and turn it into a, math, a general mathematical theory of perception. And so I was working with Bruce, who was a just genius mathematician, and Chaitan Prakash, who was a genius as well, a mathematical genius, and still collaborate. I still collaborate with him. So we wrote down this mathematical structure, and it was looking at that mathematical structure that I began to realize, holy smoke, it might be, it might be, mm. That we're not seeing the truth. It, I mean, it hadn't didn't have a proof, but it, but the 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 idea that we might not be seeing the truth was just so overwhelming that I that I had to sit down and I, so I completely understand what my colleagues just you know the idea that space time is doomed and neuroscience isn't fundamental it is 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 just too stunning, too stunning. So I've had I've had more than thirty years to 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 live with this, and so that that helps to you know it, it takes a while to to live with it and. So, so I wasn't always there. I, I, my, my father was a, a, a Protestant fundamentalist minister. So I, so I got you know, a Christian fundamentalist framework, but, but there was so much, I mean, there, there are of course good things, love your neighbor as yourself. And there's some good stuff in there, but there's a lot of nonsense. And I, at, at some point I, there was, I saw so much nonsense, you know, that, that I, you know, I didn't know what parts of it to take seriously or not. So I, I really had to just go my own way. And, and, and so, so I can now come back and, and I think more intelligently come back and find the parts of, of, you know, Christian and other spiritual traditions and then say what, what makes sense there. And then, you know, as a scientist, I mean, I don't even take my own theories that seriously, right? It's, it's, so I don't take, I mean, I take them seriously in the sense that I want to be precise and see precisely what they entail. But the chance that I'm right is very, very low. So, I mean, Kurt, you were on Kurt J. Mungle's show. I mean, and you, that's where you spoke to Joshua Buck. Uh, Kurt and I were chatting and we were chatting about how these theories of everything, trying to figure out the truth of reality, can sometimes mess with your spirituality, with your deeper understanding of yourself and meaning. How does that affect you? How did it affect you? Did it impact the way you perceived meaning, value, morals, ethics? Because that's also part of this show, uh, from my side at least. Um, how did it impact you personally? Right. Well, the the issue of morals and meaning is really important here. If if space time is fundamental, and particles are fundamental, and as as Francis Crick said, and and, and, and by the way, you know, I, Francis was a good friend, and he wrote letters of recommendation for me. He did all sorts of very very kind things for me, and I learned a lot from him. I, so so, but when Francis said you're nothing but a pack of neurons, right? And, and, and but he would, by the way, you might say, well, that's horrible in terms of meaning and so forth. He was a gentleman, he was a wonderful person. He, he, he was better than that philosophy. <laughs> but so the question is, what, how do we have meaning in a, in a situation like this? Now, now, some of my good friends will say, look, when you die, that's it. And so the meaning is, that makes life very valuable and very precious. And so the meaning is the very brevity of life. And, and the meaning is what you, what you, you give to it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so that's, that's one approach to it. Um, but, but ultimately, there's going to be the death of the universe, right? If space time is fundamental, there was the Big Bang. And there's either going to be a big crunch or, or some kind of cold, death, cold entropic death, one, one of the two, there's something's going to happen. And everything that we've 
done is going to be erased from that framework and there's nothing, nothing that literally nothing that will survive. And so there, there is in some sense, the meaning that I can make in sort of the existentialist kind of sense where I you know, rebel against the, the, the meaninglessness of it. And I create my own meaning uh, out of the, so there, there is that kind of way that you can go at it. So I'm not saying you can't try to create meaning in that, but, but I think that a lot of us are looking for something different. Yes. And it could be an, an illusion, right? It could be an illusion. The, the framework that I'm working on in, in which consciousness is fundamental <clears throat> um, does open up the possibility of deeper kinds of, of, of meaning. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and also I've, I've been very interested in looking at something that's not from my own past. I mean, I was raised into the Christian fundamentalist framework. Eastern mysticism, was not only not taught, it was, it was actively discouraged. I mean, you, you should, you know, that's from the devil, it's, it's horrible stuff and so forth. So, so, but I've been recently studying it now and, and, and you know, again, not, not taking it to be the truth, mm. but, but taking it as a source of insights. And so there's the notion that, that there's this timeless aspect to consciousness, mm -hmm. right? That there's, the eternal now and so forth. And so I've been thinking about my mathematical framework. And it, it turns out that when I write down this dynamics of conscious agents, you have to write down a probability space on which the dynamics occurs. You, without the probability space, you can't write down the dynamics. So that's, I'm, I'm forced by the mathematics to write down this structure and say, it exists, let it be. So there's this mathematical structure probability space and and then there's this dynamics that takes place on top of it so what is that structure that pre-exists all the interplay of the experiences that are occurring on that well holy smoke maybe that's what we might call the eternal now the the awareness without content i mean I, i'm what, what struck me was i wasn't thinking about that when i wrote wrote it down the mathematics for me forced me to write it down and then later on when i was asking so what does this mean i began to realize that there are connections between what the Eastern, some Eastern traditions are, are saying, you know, spiritual traditions are saying, not, they don't say it precisely, right? They only use words, not, not mathematics. And then there's the notion of then how does time arise? And what's, what's one thing I'm playing with, and I'm not saying that this is right, but it's, it's the kind of idea that comes up. If you have a Markovian dynamics, it turns out that you can have what is called a stationary dynamics, where the entropy of the dynamics does not change with time. The entropy is constant over the sequence time of, of the, so there's no entropic time, right? The entropy and time, as we think about them in physics, are intimately linked. The arrow of time is intimately linked with the second law of thermodynamics. Entropy is always increasing. So, so I can write, excuse me, I can write down a dynamics in, that, that is non-entropic, where, where, well, where the entropy isn't increasing. So it's timeless in that sense, but it turns out it's a trivial theorem that if you take any conditional, if you look at that Markovian dynamics, it's stationary, but if you take a conditional probability, like, so I'll be very precise for the, the geeks in the audience, real, so I have- Yeah, please, please do. Okay, so this is slightly technical. So I have a sequence xn, you know, x1, x2, x3 through xn. What I just said was that for a stationary dynamical system, h of xn equals h of x sub n minus 1 for all n. Right? However, if I do conditioning, if I take h of xn given x1, mm -hmm. then it turns out you induce uh, an entropy. H, so it turns out that h of xn given x1 is greater than or equal to h of xn minus 1 given x1. Mm -hmm. Or whatever you can do. So I, I choose x1, but any set that you condition on. So what's interesting is when you take a projection of the stationary dynamics, any projection that you want, you induce entropy and therefore time, entropic time, merely as an artifact of the projection. So space-time could simply be an artifact of the projection of a timeless dynamics of consciousness, the stationary. And so, so, that's, so that's the kind of possibility that begins to open up. We can now 
So what's, what's interesting here is we could have this dynamics of consciousness in which there may not be competition, in which there may not be dog eat dog, but and, and there's no entropic time. But when you take a projection, all of a sudden you get the artifact of time. And now that dynamics looks like evolution by natural selection, it's me against you. It's it's so that would be incredibly rewarding if we could show that this dynamics of consciousness in which there is no, nothing like competition and, and so forth. Perhaps we'll see what I mean, I don't know, but maybe evolution by natural selection is just an artifact of the projection of this deeper theory. So it's going to be really fun. I mean, you can see all the, the, the opportunities that explore once we let go of the mental straitjacket of space-time and space-time reductionism, let go of that straitjacket, the possibilities that open up are mind-blowing and the technologies that could come out of this are, are mind-blowing. Uh, you, you talk about Makovian kernels. I know you said you skimmed over it a little bit, but I know when I read your papers, you, uh, there was there's a lot about Carl Friston's work. I mean, he's one of the most cited neuroscientists in the world. And he talks yeah. about the uh, minimizing free energy principle. And your yeah. theory seems to work with this theory as well. They seem to coincide very well. Uh, they, they seem to coincide very well. And I, I, I personally want to study this more. I, I've, <clears throat> I've been starting to read some of Friston's papers. And, and so I think that there's something to it that, that it might be that, um, the dynamics of conscious agents can also be understood in terms of the mathematics of the that, that he's been looking at at the free energy principle. So I, I definitely want to, to look at that. And the, the notion of a Markov blanket could be uh, could be one way of sort of carving up the one big conscious agent into the the subconscious agents and their their dynamics. And so so I, I absolutely I, I there's a lot that I want to to study there and um, the you know, Markov blankets and the interface theory of perception are very very similar in, in spirit a, a, as well yes. um, the, the Markov blanket given so what's what's interesting when when you have these Bayes nets you can have a set of nodes and the the Markov blanket of that of set of nodes is all the parents of the nodes all the offspring of the nodes and all the parents of the offspring of the nodes. That's the so-called Markov blanket of, of that set of nodes. And it's a remarkable theorem. This is wonderful work by Judea Pearl and others um, that the state of the nodes outside of the Markov blanket are independent of the states of the nodes inside the blanket when you condition on the blanket. That's a very technical way of saying the blanket is a user interface, <laughs> the, 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 right? In other words, you don't see the truth mm -hmm. because the states of the world are independent yes. of, of your inner states conditioned on the blanket. That means that the blanket can't possibly tell you all the states of the world. <laughs> mm -hmm. The states of the world are independent. Mm -hmm. so. So that's also the user interface idea. So I, I think it's going to be very, very interesting to, to explore. So I, you know, th that's another reason why I lot of, want a lot of people to jump in. I can only do so many things. I, I could explore that or I could go after the physics stuff. And right now I'm really interested in going after the, the physics stuff because if, if I could show how the amplitudehedron ar arises from the asymptotic dynamics of conscious agents, that would be... I think the quickest way to get people to take this kind of idea seriously yes. um, and, and so forth. So, so it's, it's all betting on what, what is the best result to get soonest to get more bright minds. Cause there's so many brilliant people out there that once these brilliant mathematic mathematicians and physicists start working on this kind of stuff, I can just sit back and read the papers. I'll be left in the dust. It's something I found quite fascinating with conscious agents and conscious realism. I mean, you, you defend the fact that, natural selection, because I'm sure that's an argument you always get, you're using natural selection as an argument for something in a reality that doesn't really exist. So natural selection, in essence, doesn't exist. But you defend that quite well with universal Darwinism. That's, that's your approach to defend that. Do you want to touch on that briefly? And then the other part I wanted to actually touch on was the uh, Turing equivalent as well. The universality of this theorem works because of the church Turing um, similarities as well. 
which is very intriguing. Right. So yeah, I'll, I'll just I'll just mention the the last the latter one because it's pretty straightforward. It's trivial to show that Markovian kernels are computationally universal. Mm -hmm. you, you can write down a couple of kernels that that um, that are their permutations permutation operators that you you can do just a, a couple of permutation operators you can prove it's trivial to prove that they're computationally universal but the interesting thing is that um markovian dynamics is not restricted to computation mm -hmm. the a markovian kernel gives you a conditional probability of something given a certain event mm -hmm. the events themselves don't need, need to be computable so the, the event structure doesn't have to be computable. So Markovian kernels, kept, they're, they're computationally universal, but they're not restricted to computation. They, they, they transcend the notion of computation. So as even though my framework is very, very simple, it's just a bunch of Markovian kernels interacting in some sense, um, it's, it's computationally universal and more. It, it, it um, basically allows for non-computational stuff if, if we want to go there. So <clears throat> now, um, the how do I the question you had about ev evolution using evolution when I think it's not the fundamental reality it's what science must do we have to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps so, so the way science works is we don't know what the truth is but we do write down theories and what's remarkable about science that's innovative I mean people have always tried to explain things and they've thought about things and they've talked about things for for thousands of years what's new about science is the following rule be mathematically precise mm -hmm. and tell us what experiment we could do that might show you're wrong mm -hmm. that's the really new thing here be mathematically precise now so that's all i've done is i've said okay our best tools right now, one of the best tools is evolution by natural selection. Let's take the mathematics of that and see what it entails. Well, it entails that we don't see reality as it is. Now, what's interesting is, and by the way, the physicists are doing the same thing. So what, what Nima and these other guys are doing, or guys in the gym, I'll say physicists, not guys, physicists are doing, <clears throat> is saying, <clears throat> let's take quantum field theory and Einstein's gravity, although <clears throat> Nima actually shows that, and others that Nima and others show that all you need is um, Einstein's special relativity, you know, irreducible representations of the Poincaré group, together with unitarity from quantum quantum theory. And, and as soon as you get unitary representation of the Poincaré group, you get quant you get gravity falling out of it. So gravity is actually uh, an implication of bringing together quantum theory and, and special relativity. Surprising result. <clears throat> you don't need falling elevators and Einstein's genius. It falls, falls out from the special relativity and, and unitary representations. But anyway, what, what the physicists are doing is saying, what are our best mathematical models of physics telling us of space-time? And they're, they're telling us that space-time itself ceases to be a coherent concept at 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, 10 to the minus 43 seconds. So, but, so that's the glory of science, is that the theories, if they're good theories, they tell you where they stop. <clears throat> what they don't tell you is what the next step should be, what's beyond space-time. Physics can't tell you that. So that's the fun of, of being a scientist, because now you get to be creative. You get to sm smoke whatever you want or drink whatever you're going to drink to get your ideas or talk with whoever you want to talk to. Be as absolutely creative as you want. want. Mm. And then ask yourself, what is beyond space time? <clears throat> and then write it down. And then you have to get serious. Mm. Okay, you took your creative leap. Fantastic. Now, do the math. You better be able to show how space-time arises from it and how you get quantum field theory and general relativity and evolution. So you got to do all that hard work. Otherwise, we shouldn't take you seriously. So that's that's the way. So that's how science pulls itself up by the bootstraps. And I think that this is a never-ending process. There is no theory of everything. 
for the reason I gave, that there's always going to be an assumption. So we're always going to be in this process of saying, okay, here's how far I got on those assumptions. Now here's the limit. Because I was so precise, I actually know where those assumptions stop and I can go no further. Okay, what are the new deeper assumptions that I, okay, but I need to be able to, to make progress. I need to be able to include everything that I've done so far. I don't want to throw away what I've done so far. I want to show how it arises. So that, I think Gödel's incompleteness theorem sort of tells us that that is going to never end. And that then leads to an interesting question. If, if I take consciousness to be fundamental, a natural question is, okay, well, well then what's consciousness doing and why? Mm. <laughs> right? Right. In the, in the physicalist framework, the particles are doing something random and for no reason. But there's certain laws. We don't know why, you know, the, the, the standard model of physics has these, these particles and we, the laws of quantum theory and, you know, that's, so be it. But there's, there's really no reason why, but that's what it does. But for consciousness, there's more of an urge. Okay, consciousness is not just random particles. Now we're talking, you better give me a reason for, you know, I mean, is consciousness doing something? And if, if so, why is it doing it? And, and the answer is, I don't know why, but, but there's only one idea that seems deep enough so far to, to be taken seriously. And that comes from Gödel's incompleteness theorem. And Gödel's incompleteness theorem basically says there's no end to the exploration of mathematical structure in principle, no end. There is no omniscience when it comes to mathematical structure. So, if consciousness is all there is, if consciousness is fundamental, in that framework, then mathematical structure can only be, be about the possibilities of consciousness, the, poss the variety of conscious experience, for example. And in that case, maybe what consciousness is up to is exploring all the possibilities, all the varieties of conscious experience, all the possibilities within consciousness. And in principle, for logical reasons that Gödel showed us, mm -hmm. that is a never ending process. Mm -hmm. That there is, there is in principle no end to it. So I, I, again, I'm not sure that that's right. I'm not sure even the way I've stated it is coherent yet. I'm, I'm not absolutely sure that what I said is coherent yes. because the notion of time that I used my, is that the entropic time? Is there this? Is, is, is there a deeper notion of, of sequence without time that I could make this argument? So, so there's a lot to, to be worked out here. But you can see that that it raises a whole new set of interesting questions. What is consciousness up to? And and if it is about exploring the, the infinite varieties of consciousness, that's sort of like the multiverse version you know, of physics, right? It, but without the commitment to phys the, the physicalism. So it's like the level four of, Mark, uh, of Max Tegmark's um, multiverse, right? Where anything that's mathematically possible is real. Well, I, I'm sort of being led in, in to a similar thing, but, but different from Max Tegmark in the sense, that, and again, I've been to meetings with him. He's a brilliant, a, a brilliant physicist and so forth, but he's taking mathematics as, as the fundamental reality itself. And, and for better or for worse, I'm saying something different. I, I'm saying that consciousness is fundamental Mathematics is more like, if, if consciousness is the living organism, mathematics is like the bones of the organism, but it's not the whole reality. But, but nevertheless, this, the Gödel incompleteness theorem is telling us something essential about what consciousness might be up to and why. And, and in, in that sense, then every possible multiverse that, that you know, Max Tegmark is thinking about may be something um, that consciousness is exploring simply because consciousness is exploring all of its all of its potentialities. And it may be really exploring in the following sense. Here we are, 99% of my colleagues are physicalists. They don't think consciousness is fundamental. So if consciousness is fundamental, notice what's, what's happening. All of us are really consciousness exploring consciousness, but, con but exploring this, frank, this particular level four multiverse aspect of consciousness, so thoroughly that we let ourselves get completely lost in in that exploration. We consciousness allows itself to get completely lost, and then it has to wake itself up and then realize as stunning as that universe was. Trillions of stars, hundreds of billions of galaxies, 
billions of light years across. I'm not that. I I am. I'm more than that. I I I transcend that. And and maybe that's how how consciousness is going through this girdle wake up process that's never ending. It plunges itself in, loses itself, wakes itself up, really understand. We, we come in as, as helpless babies. We know nothing. We're completely dependent. We, we, consciousness is, is starting essentially from nothing. Oh, well, not nothing, but if you look at the baby's brain, there's, there's plenty there. So James, James but, but booming, buzzing. <laughs> that's right, the bluesing, blooming, uh, Jane, William James, blooming, buzzing confusion. Mm. Fortunately, it does have some coherence, but it has to build up more. Co but it's completely helpless in, in some sense. And, and it has to learn all the new rules of this game. And then you know, only when it's older begins to question whether consciousness it might be consciousness I mean, or, or, and so forth. Although you know, children do have this animism early on, which is interesting that we then. So we have this animism that we tend to think of rocks and trees and so forth is having spirits and then we grow out of it but then i'm growing back into it and so maybe you know that's so it's, it's very interesting to look at the human experience from this framework and ask does it make sense mm. is the very fact that my brilliant colleagues are still physicalists really an interesting aspect of this exploration that consciousness is doing of itself within uh, this particular physical framework and waking itself up and, and just to be clear for the listeners and, and, and all the viewers, um, w when you say conscious agents, you're not talking about specifically human beings. You're talking from, I mean, from your papers, neonates, even forward information. You're, you're talking about information and this conscious agent network and framework. Right. Just to make you're, clarification. You're absolutely right. You, that's, a, that's an incredibly important point, Tevin. Um, conscious agents are not, human agents are... Mm a probability zero subset of the conscious agents. The, the, the variety of conscious agents transcends anything that I could even imagine. Mm. Um, and by the way, this, this also, I should also just mention the notion of life, right? So there's the, we divide our world into animate and inanimate kinds of objects. And we think that that's a principal distinction. Electrons are inanimate, rocks are inanimate, the mountains are inanimate. Viruses, hard to know. Bacteria, they're living, probably not conscious, but they're living. And of course, you know, mammals and reptiles, and those are and you know, plants, those are living. From the point of view that I'm talking about, the distinction that we make between animate and inanimate objects is not a principal distinction. It's an artifact of the limitations of our space time interface. An interface, by definition, gives you more insight into some aspects of what you're interacting with and necessarily less insights into other aspects. You're, you're, it's a data compression and data elimination and, and data deletion framework. So I look at a, a rock and I get very little hint about the nature of consciousness. I look at a person and I mean, I get a lot of insights into a, a mood, uh, belief systems, emotions, and so forth. When I look at a cat, I'm getting less, but I get some, but less. A rat, even less. You know, bacteria, even less. And a rock, none. That is not an indication of the reality that I'm interacting with. That limitation is a limitation of my interface. And so, w once again, we tend to reify our interface. And this is the fundamental error. We reify our interface. We take the limits of our interface as an insight into reality. Fortunately, with science, we can transcend that very understandable mistake. Mm. With, Don, I mean, I mean, we'll slow, slowly close off, but with, with the conscious agents framework, um, you touch a lot on memory, predictive coding, attention. Uh, do you want to briefly discuss that? Because the mathematics is quite complicated for most people who's going to, who are going to try and read your papers. Um, how do we... <clears throat> How do we talk about these things now? How do we touch on memory? How do we discuss these concepts under this con conscious agents framework? Th that's right. So one of the things that we don't assume is memory in the fundamental building blocks, and and so the and nor the notion of a self. Uh, 
So what we have to do is to build networks of conscious agents. And we have, we've just done the baby beginnings of this. Some work that I've done with the, uh, Chris Fields, a, a, a brilliant collaborator, um, took, took the lead on. We have a paper that um, well, I can give you a reference to and we may put a pointer on where we actually start building conscious agent networks to try to do things like memory and, and, and certain elementary kinds of problem solving and so forth. So, but all the work is ahead on that, right? The, here, here's the good, the good news. Because conscious agent networks are computationally universal, I have no doubt that anything that we can do with neural networks, we can do with conscious agent networks. There's just, it's a theorem. So there is no doubt that all of this stuff can be done. And it's just a matter, it's a different framework than neural networks. They're similar, but, they're, but they are very, very different. And so we'll, we'll need to, to, to build all those frameworks. And then we'll want to show how what we call neural network frameworks arise as a, a, a space-time projection of certain aspects of these conscious agent networks. So, and, and by the way, I mean, I love neuroscience. I'm a cognitive neuroscientist myself. I've, I've even been a co-author on an fMRI study and EEG studies and, and, and so forth. And, and many of my good colleagues are, 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 are leaders in, 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 I'm absolutely for advances in neuroscience. And what I'm saying is actually job security for neuroscience. Right now, we thought, I look in the microscope, I see neurons and neural networks and so forth, and that's what I've got. No, that's, that's just what you see. We have to take our dynamics of neural networks and reverse engineer it and ask, what is the deeper dynamics that projects into what we call neural networks? So this is real job security. Cognitive neuroscience has just become much more difficult. It's a much deeper process. We can't take neurons and neural activity for granted. We have to reverse engineer them and look for a deeper framework outside of space and time that then projects into those neural networks. So, so this opens up all sorts of, so more funding for neuroscience, not less. So, so when I say neurons do not exist when they're not perceived, I, I honestly believe the moon doesn't exist when it's not perceived. Neurons don't exist when they're not perceived. Neurons cause none of our behavior. And we need more funding for neuroscience because we have to reverse engineer this data structure in our interface to understand what lies beyond the space-time interface. So more, more funding for neuroscience, but neurons don't exist when they're not perceived. Mm. And that goes back to Einstein asking that question as well, I mean, about the moon. Is it really there when he's not looking? Einstein did ask. He, Einstein was a realist. Mm. He, at, at least, a lot of his writings suggest that he was a realist. He, 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 he asked, do you really believe, according to quantum mechanics, that's what he was worried about was quantum mechanics on this. Do you really believe the moon doesn't exist when no one looks? And, and Einstein had this paper in 1935, in which he and his, you know, the EPR, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rose in their paper, where they, they introduced really um, The idea that that, that um, systems can be connected without being in touch with each other, right? So, so he he raised in that paper the idea that if without disturbing a system, we can predict with probability one the value of a physical property like position, then he said there must be an element of reality corresponding to that. So, so that was to say, if without disturbing a system, we can predict with probability one um, the value of the outcome of a measurement, then that value had to exist ahead of time. And, and it, it turns out that th that's not the case. There's a wonderful paper by Chris Fuchs um, uh, called Quantum Bayesianism, Cubism. <clears throat> I, not the 2010 paper, I highly recommend it where he, he, is, is, he describes an experiment done by some others or a, a, a quantum construction in which you can prove that the outcome doesn't exist, or this quantum measurement, the sequence of measurements doesn't exist before you do it, but you can also guarantee with probability one what the outcome will be. So, 
So Einstein, his idea seems very intuitive. It seems very, very plausible. Surely if you can predict with probability one, what you're going to see without disturbing the system, then it must have already existed. Well, we now have concrete quantum systems where, where the, the they're entangled in certain ways, so it's an, it's entanglement, which is the thing that Einstein introduced in this 1935 paper. He thought he was introducing entanglement to, to show that quantum theory is all screwed up, and in fact, entanglement is real, and his, his notion of reality is all screwed up. So, so it, it turns out prediction with probability one doesn't mean that it exists. And even though I know with probability one that I'll see the moon when I look there, I know where to look, that just means that I create it I, on the fly and then I delete it when I don't need it. It's just a user interface symbol. Mm. And that's what quantum theory is basically telling us. Don, a, a question. I mean, I, I asked this to all my guests because the listeners and viewers seem to really love this. Um, they like to know if I had to ask you who are five, let's say, scientists or philosophers that you recommend they should read and who influenced you growing up, who would those be? Or if you had to even just give us a general list. Um, because it helps us well, to, helps guide our thinking of how you developed your sort of thoughts and the way you develop who you became today. Interesting. Mm. Well, um, if I allow myself to go over my entire life, not just my youth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In any. Oh, okay. Well, I would say in order to sort of give them a great, better understanding of this mind body problem. I mean, it's called mind body solution. Uh, how can they get a closer understanding of the mind body problem? And well, on the physics side, um, I would recommend Nima Arkani Hamed. He's spectacular in the sense that he's doing first rate work at the forefronts of the hard mathematics of physics. And yet he has this talent for communicating to a broad audience. And he has public lectures that he really, so I highly recommend. And for those who want to go deeper, um, <clears throat> he's got a, a semester long course at Harvard in 2019. So if you Google Neymar Kani Hamed Harvard 2019, you can, his lectures are free online. I would study his lectures and you'll, you'll get this stunning realization that, you know, as you said, it's stunning. Space time is doomed. Physicists don't believe space time. It's just stunning. So I would, that, that I... Any philosophers influenced your thinking growing up? Um, when I was growing up very young, um, there was a, a couple philosophers. I was, so was, I was raised in a Christian tradition, so I was reading these Christian philosophers. So Francis Schaeffer mm -hmm. um, had an influence on me. I, you know, I... I, I wouldn't recommend him now. I mean, I, so this is no more historical. Yes. I, I, looking back, I, 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 I think it's too limited a perspective. Um, in terms of people, I would rec recommend. Um, yeah, but what are your thoughts on people well, like Locke, Hume, Berkeley, um, those types of philosophers who actually touched on the philosophy of perception, Whitehead, Leibniz? Leibniz, Leibniz is a flat out genius. Um, and it, in his monadology, he clearly understood what we call the hard problem of consciousness. And he, he clearly said it wasn't going to be solved. He, he has his famous allegory of, of, the, of a mill. And he basically said, you know, if you, if you go inside any physical system and try to figure out where consciousness comes from. It would be like going inside of a mill and going smaller, smaller, and you see all the gears and so forth. And there's going to be no explanation for, of consciousness from all the gears and wheels. And I, I think he's right. I mean, I think that he understood that the hard problem couldn't be solved. And he would probably come back to come to us right now and said, hey, guys, I told you that three centuries ago. What, what, what gives? You know, move on. And he even had in his monadology the idea of taking perceivers as fundamental and trying to build. So he would probably look at my stuff and said, that's what I was doing in the monodology. And I suspect, I mean, Leibniz was this mathematical genius. I suspect if, if, if he were here, he could look at my stuff in 10 minutes and say, okay, second rate, here's what you need to do. And he would then take it and run, run, run off. And I would be trying to catch up and understand what he did. So, so hats off to, to Leibniz and I highly recommend, um, Bar Barclay is, is great. I mean, he, he didn't have the mathematical 
chops that, that Leibniz had. But, but Berkeley had the idea that, um, that space-time isn't fundamental, physical objects aren't fundamental, and that somehow to be is to be perceived or to be a perceiver. And I'm saying something very, very similar. To, to be is to be perceived or to be a, a, a perceiver. Mm -hmm. And so Barclay, um, my, my advisor, um, David Marr, if you're interested in, in vision, his, his, his book vision mm -hmm. is a great introduction. The, the field that came out in 1982, the field of course has moved on dramatically, but in terms of an influence in the field, he, he was, he was a, a huge influence. Uh, on the field, um, and so so again, yeah, those are a few of the of the influences. I'm trying to think of. I mean, Francis Crick had a huge influence on me, um, and so his 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 book, um, The Astonishing Hypothesis. Again, I disagree with his conclusion you know, that you are nothing but a pack of neurons, but it's a wonderful insight into um, a genius. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had the privilege for many, many, for a couple decades almost, of meeting with Francis at, at the Helmholtz Club at, at the University of California at Irvine. We would meet once a month on average and a group of, you know, a dozen to 18 of us studying the hard problem of consciousness and, and the neuroscience. And, and Francis had an incredible impl influence on me and impact on me because even in his late seventies, early eighties, he was this, this towering genius and and he had more command of the facts and better reasoning ability than i ever had at any point in my life and so so i mean he got the nobel prize for for very good reason this this guy was a complete genius so 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 yeah so, and I, I one other person i would mention is is vs ramakandran his work um his brilliant experiments and his brilliant thought experiments and working with phantom limbs and so forth has had a huge influence and he's been a, a good friend. And so I would recommend, you know, um, Phantoms in the Brain by, by V.S. Ramakandran. Really, really, if you want to see a guy that really thinks out of the box and is, is creative, you know, Rama is one of the best in terms of really creative thinking and, and experiments. I think that book comes with a nice forward by Oliver Sacks as well. Yes, yes. Very, very good. I mean, I mean, people probably also come to you and say, like, I mean, this, I mean, what's new? I mean, Ramachandran has done this, has done this before. Gibson, um, a lot of people have been saying this for a long time, but utilitarian theory. But yours is very fundamentally different. I just want to give you this last opportunity. I mean, yeah. um, I mean, the main goal of this podcast is to allow the guest the opportunity to express their theories without interruption. I hope I didn't interrupt you at any point. <laughs> But it's been wonderful. Thank you to make it to allow you an opportunity to get the listeners to let the viewers because most of them get are very lazy nowadays. People don't want to read papers. They just want this easy opportunity to hear the actual author speak their mind. So any objections you want to run through anything you want to say um, to the listeners to the viewers that you've been thinking and you've been wanting to address for a while and this is your chance. <laughs> okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll just mention one that um, is a really good technical objection that some um, researchers at Yale have given to the um, interface theory of perception, the idea that we've been shaped by natural selection not to see the truth, but, but just to see a user interface. Mm -hmm. And what they, they re-ran our simulations um, and our genetic algorithms and so forth. And when they, of course, did what we did, they got the same results. You know, seeing the truth made you go extinct. But then they said, what if you, instead of having a single fitness payoff function, we they put up to 20,000 fitness payoff functions, randomly chosen according to a beta distribution and so forth. And, and what they found was that um, in that case, um, there's really no single fitness payoff that you can be tuned to, so you can't be tuned to the fitness, and, and so your fitness doesn't beat truth. So and then a couple other objectives have gone along the lines where you, if you have tons and tons of fitness payoff functions, then, then you won't see the fitness, you'll see the truth. So, so what happens is they were in their simulations, they were only having um, 
one world that you that you could only represent all the fitness payoffs on one world you weren't carving that world up mm -hmm. but suppose that you allow the organism to start to group the fitness payoffs so these are functions so you do hierarchical clustering of these fitness payoffs ones that have similar shapes you cluster together and you create you create a simplified unit we'll call it a, a unit or an object you know so there could be features units or even like what we call physical objects, use them as data structures to capture a whole group of fitness payoffs that are very, very similar, maybe different actions, but, but a similar set of fitness payoffs. And so once we, so we redid the simulations from the, from the group at, at Yale. And by, and by the way, it's all very friendly and they're, they're beautiful, wonderful people. In fact, the, the leader of the, of the group there is, is a personal friend of one of my collaborators. And so this is all, all very friendly. And what we, what we found is that when we allow to organize the fitness payoffs into these hierarchical clusters, then once again, truth dies and, and fitness wins. And, and of course, that's what we see. We see objects all around us. And, and, and what are objects? If objects are not the real world, Right, I see the moon. It's not because there's a physical object. What they're, they're data structures. What are they for from an evolutionary point of view? They are shorthands for fitness payoffs. When I see an apple, I an apple is a data structure of hierarchically clustering a bunch of fitness payoffs. I can take an apple. I can eat it. It's not worth trying to mate with it. And if I, you know, I'm not going to try to cut paper with it. There's so there's things I could. So when I see an apple, what I get is this a, a cluster of fitness payoff functions, different actions. There are different things I can do. With, I can throw it at you. I can hit you in the head with it. Um, but if for that, a rock is going to do a lot better job than an apple. So every diff, every object is a different cluster of fitness payoffs. And so once we, so so a lot of objections have been to say, yeah, your simulations only use one fitness payoff, and of course then fitness wins over true. And so we, we're now about to write ourselves, we're, we're writing a paper right now where we explain the origin of objects as hierarchical clusters of fitness payoffs. And once you do that, then you can handle any number of fitness payoffs, no problem, and truth goes extinct once again. So that would be, I mean, that's one of the, the, the perhaps the deepest technical question that I've gotten. Um, I mean, I, I get questions all the time where people go, silly. If the train isn't real, step in front of it. I mean, and, and, and they, they think that that's a one-off that, that kills the whole thing. The, um, th that, that question just doesn't really come to grips with, with evolutionary theory. But this other question does. When you, have, when you say there's 20,000 fitness payoffs, what do you do then? Then, then that, that required response that we're giving right now, which is that we're writing a paper, hopefully get out by June or something like that, where we show hierarchical clustering. So that would, that would say, I would say, I've had lots of responses. That is the most serious response, and it's serious enough that we're that we're writing a, a paper on it. Any, any small ones you can address. The small ones. I mean, even that one about the train. I mean, you have a very good answer for it anyway. Yeah. Oh right. Yeah, I, I should yeah say you know, very very briefly right because that that does I think for a lot of people um, have a lot of psychological yeah. weight. Very real. To and so thing. so I wouldn't step in front of the train. For the same reason, I wouldn't take my blue icon on my desktop and carelessly drag it to the trash can icon. Not because the, I, I take that blue icon literally, my file isn't blue, it's not rectangular, but I do take that icon seriously. If I drag my icon to the trash can, I could lose a year of work. Say it's a book. I could lose a year of work. So, so the key idea here then is that evolution by natural selection now I'm taking the theory on its own terms, has shaped us with perceptual systems designed to keep us alive. That's what they're for from an evolutionary. They're there to keep you alive. You had better take them seriously. If I see a snake, don't pick it up unless you really know you're a snake handler, you know what you're doing. If you see a cliff, don't jump off unless you're Galen Roll and know how to climb mountains. I mean, you have to take them seriously, but it's a logical error to conclude that you get to take them literally. You must take them seriously, but it, that doesn't entail that you get to take them literally. And that's a simple logical error. Mm -hmm. And the desktop interface really sort of betrays that error, right? I must take my icons very, very seriously. 
but it doesn't mean that I have to take them, that, that I'm entitled to take them literally. It's, 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 it's a beginner's mistake to think that I can take them literally. Oh, there really is a blue icon. Let me look inside my computer and see where that blue icon is. That's, 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 a, that's a beginner's mistake. And we're making that same mistake in evolution. So, so yeah, that's, that's one that I think um, a lot of people, it stops them. So that's a good, I'm glad that you sort of prompted me to sort of bring that one out. And, and, um, I was thinking about the more technical things, but that that's really gets in people's way. Do any of them call you an idealist? Do any of them like make the claim that you're a an idealist? Well, yes, and and you know, philosophically, um, idealism is is the idea that in some sense um, consciousness is fundamental, and so there are. I could say, yeah. The, Depending on how you define idealism, you could you could say what I'm doing is is getting a mathematical model of idealism, um, and so so yeah, most of my colleagues are physicalists. Um, um, I'm not a dualist, so dualism is the idea that there are you know as as you well know that there's two fundamental aspects to reality. There's a fundamentally physical reality and a fundamental non-physical, maybe conscious kind of reality. Descartes is famous for that. Um, and so I'm not, I'm not a dualist. I'm, I'm not a physicalist. I think the closest thing would be I, idealism. I, I, I called my, I called my approach conscious realism instead of idealism on purpose. Very carefully. I didn't call it idealism because there's a lot of in philosophy. There's the word idealism is used in many different ways. I didn't want to get dragged into that, that thing. So I just coined my own term. And idealism in philosophy has often been associated somewhat with an anti-science point of view. It, it, it has been against science. And, and Barclay came up with this idealism as, as sort of, in, in some sense, it was a reaction to Newton. Mm -hmm. and, and, and idealism really hadn't, in this, in this anti-science spirit, it wasn't then proposed as a mathematically precise theory. So I didn't want to be associated with this history of, it, it isn't necessarily anti-science, it's just historically happens in many cases to have been associated with anti-science points of view, it, it, but it doesn't have to be. And so I didn't, I just didn't want that kind of connection between what I was doing and that anti-science, nor the non-mathematical approach. So I, I'm really interested in the scientific theory. So I, I called it conscious realism. I'm taking um, I'm saying there is a reality. See, another thing about idealism is it's sometimes confused with anti-realism, that, that nothing, you know, that there's, that, that nothing is real and, and, and so forth. So I want to say, no, I'm positing. And of course, as I mentioned, I'm probably wrong, mm -hmm. but, but, but the point is to be precise so we can figure out where I'm wrong. But I'm positing that there is a reality and it consists of consciousness. Okay, so bold hypothesis, here's the mathematics. Now let's go figure out what's wrong with that hypothesis. But you have to have a bold hypothesis on the table before you can take it apart. Until Einstein gave us the theory of space-time, we couldn't take it apart and, and say why, why it has a limit. And so we have to just go there. So, so I didn't call it, so technically, yes, it is a form of idealism, but I called it conscious realism for the reasons I just gave. And, and you're certainly not an anti-realist because if, if anyone reads your paper, you can tell. I mean, you've got you've even got a diagram. It shows you. I mean, you're looking at the naive realist, the the critical realist, and you're showing how the interface theory actually incorporates all of them in a sense. Uh, that that's a very important point, Devin, and, and this is one that um, my my good friend and collaborator Manish Singh has has made to me as well. And that is that whether or not you believe in the interface theory of perception. It's the right framework to evaluate sensory evolution because the truth hypothesis is a special case in the broader framework of all the theories in which truth it doesn't require truth. So, so if you're going to study evolution of a natural selection, you need to assume to begin with the framework of all the hypotheses of systems that don't evolve to truth and then show that, you know, there are some kind of pressures toward the truth if you want to get there. I mean, what I'm finding is that there are no pressures in general toward the truth. Of course, I should say this, of course you can find very special cases in which you will go to the truth. I'm saying if you look at the generic case, it doesn't go to the truth. Or to put it a different way, the probability is zero that a sensory system would evolve toward the truth. Except for the one example, I, the one 
exception that I gave, which are sigma algebras. Um, but that's the only. And I, I think like for the, um, to give one more last objection, I mean, people probably claim that it must be some sort of a spiritual claim. This must be a religious claim that consciousness is fundamental. What do you say to that? I mean, are you an atheist? Are you an agnostic regarding the origins of the universe? What are you? What is your religious claim? Well, that's, that's a great question. So, so for me, I'm positing the theory of conscious agents and conscious realism, absolutely not as a religious hypothesis. It, for me, it's, it's a mathematical hypothesis. Now, as a scientist, I get my ideas wherever I can, right? You, you, you get creative ideas from wherever you, and, and you have to take the ideas that you get and then take them with a grain of salt too. And so I've been, I was steeped, of course, in Christian ideas, and I had to walk away from a lot of it. I, but not all of it, of course. Um, I love your neighbor as yourself. I think is is uh, fabulous. Mm. Um, I've been looking at ideas from um, Eastern mystical traditions, Buddhism, um, Hinduism, Sufism, um, Kabbalah, so forth. Uh, my attitude is. I'm not a devotee of any, um, but I'm a student of any. I'm happy to, to learn. What, one thing that I, I note is they're trying to be helpful. They're, they're often they're, they're trying to help people wake up to you know, reduce suffering and so forth. And they use language as pointers. And, uh, but they also understand that they're just pointers. And Rumi is famous for saying the language of God is silence. All else is poor translation. But you still have to give pointers. And so they use, they'll say that, but then they will have books and books of, of language pointing to what, what can't be spoken. What, what I've found is I am very helped by listening to their ideas. And I, I, for example, one of the people who expresses it very, very clearly and has been helpful to me is, is Eckhart Tolle. So he, he, um, he doesn't claim to be a scientist or anything like that, but he, he's a spiritual teacher, but he somehow has a real knack for taking the ideas, getting away from thousands of years of sort of ways of saying things that may not connect to someone who's, you know, raised in California. <laughs> and, and so he, so I've learned a lot, but, but again, I take none of this as a, as a devotee. I, I, mm. um, I take it as someone who's trying to understand. And um, so I'll, I'll then look at how there might be some convergence between the kinds of thoughts that they're having, the ideas that they're having and the mathematics that, that I'm developing. And, and as I mentioned, there was that one about the timelessness and getting time as entropy by conditional probability from something that's timeless, that that was a case where my thoughts were actually influenced by something I was hearing from Eastern traditions and maybe think in a new way and then look at my mathematics and go, oh yeah, the mathematics is already saying that. The, the possibility is already there. So that kind of thing I, I like. And <clears throat> I do I, I do some podcasts on the interaction between spirituality and science. I mean, I did one just yesterday, in fact, and I'm very interested in that because I think that the spiritual traditions have something important to say, but they don't have the tool of science. And as deep and as bright as their insights might be, even if you're Einstein, I mean, a, a flat out genius. And you have this deep insight, right? Einstein, so he, he gets in like nine, 1907, the idea that if I'm in a falling elevator, mm. I'm standing on a scale, I will all of a sudden weigh zero. Brilliant idea. And it takes them several years, seven or eight years to turn that into mathematics. And, that, and that's the point. It's one, it's, it's one thing to say it with words and to, have, and to be a genius and to say the truth with words. It's another thing to turn it into science. Mm. And so when he did turn it into science, then- Faraday Maxwell sort of situation. Exactly. Faraday, a complete genius. Faraday was an experimental genius. And then Maxwell looks at the decades of work of Faraday. He says, thank you very much. This is incredible stuff. 
And oh, by the way, I can summarize everything that you've done in a few equations. Actually, with with geometric algebra, the, the mathematics of geometric algebra, you can write down in one equation that there is the Maxwell equation in geometric algebra. It captures everything. And so all of Faraday's experiments are captured in one equation. If you use geom if you use standard physical, you, then there's the so-called Maxwell equations. There's several equations, but th that's actually a very inefficient. The, the, geometric algebra is the right way to do it, not not the standard physics way of cross products are nonsense. So you use cross products in the in in, in the Maxwell's equation, and the, and the cross product is just nonsense. Mm. So there. So but but anyway, the the point here is that. A genius can have the right ideas. Einstein can have the right ideas, but until you put them into mathematics, you don't get the power of those ideas. The, the ideas came back and, and said there are black holes, and Einstein didn't know that. He didn't believe it. His theory. So I would like spirituality to get to the point where the ideas have the power to come back and teach us because we've made them formal. And, and, and again, the reply will be, from an Eastern tradition, for example, that the truth transcends thought. No, if you can talk about it, that isn't it. Agreed. And yet we talk about it, right? The spiritual traditions talk about it. The, and they'll say, well, we're giving you pointers. Well, science is the way to develop ever more valuable pointers. And to then tell you, and they say, well, every pointer is limited. Science pointers tell you where they're limited. Space time is doomed at 10 to the minus 33. That's where it's limited. So, so if we want to have better pointers and pointers that say, here's where I get off, here's where pointers stop and truth continues, then why not do science? So I would like to see science and spirituality come together in, in, in this sense. And I think that it is possible. Um, the spiritual traditions were already there saying that space time isn't fundamental, but they didn't have the math. Yes. Science has the math, and now it's about to wake up. It is waking up to space time is not fundamental. So I see the time is ripe mm. for a convergence, but dogmatism is the big yes. impediment. Everybody is going to have to realize the things that they deeply believed are deeply e either flat out false or have deep limits, hard limits. These pointers go only so far. And it's one thing to say my pointers have limits, but then it's another thing to really be willing to let go of my pointers. And I think many traditions don't want to let go of their pointers. And, and so, so it, this is perhaps a part of the waking up process. Maybe this is where consciousness is going, where it developed the tools of science, studying the headset. And now it's ready to go outside of the headset and study itself more fully, consciousness. And that's the science and spirituality um, cooperation. And I think that's a beautiful way to end. I mean, it sounds like you're epistemologically aware of it all. But you're still ontologically agnostic and willing to accept anything regarding the origins of the universe or what it is. That's that's exactly right, because I think no idea that I can have is it. Mm. But I'm here to have ideas <laughs> and to find their limits. And so that's so so dogmatism is out from the get go. God, dogmatism is just plain wrong. Mm. <laughs> and thank you so much for this conversation. I mean, I've, I've enjoyed it thoroughly. Tevin, it's been a great pleasure. Thank you so much. You've, you've done a wonderful job. I, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. it. And, and I'm sure I always say this at the end. I mean, the listeners had to have taken at least one step closer to the mind body solution after hearing everything from you. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> thank or at you. least the next step. <laughs> let's hope that let's hope the future scientists are going to take us there and use your work and do exactly what you asked them to do. So thanks, Don. Thank you very much, Tevin.